191. So now we'll look at 191 here, deepening one's perspective on the world. So these are the actual sutra texts, or in some cases, slightly abbreviated versions of those. So the first one is Four Wonderful Things. Ah, isn't that nice? Okay, so monks, on the manifestation of the Tathagata, the Arhat, the perfectly enlightened one, four wonderful and marvelous things appear. What for? Kind of a classic opening to a sutra. People, for the most part, delight in attachment. But when the Dharma of non-attachment is taught, people wish to listen to it and try to understand it. This is the first wonderful and marvelous thing. Okay? Even though it's kind of against the grain, people find it interesting and kind of want to know more about it. The second one, people for the most part delight in conceit. But when the Dharma is taught by the Tathagata for the um, abolition, thank you, of <laughs> conceit, People wish to listen to it. This is the second wonderful and marvelous thing. The third one, people for the most part delight in restlessness. But when the Dharma of peace is taught by the Tathagata, people wish to listen to it. This is the third wonderful and marvelous thing. And the fourth one, people for the most part live in ignorance. But when the Dharma is taught by the Tathagata for the um, Abolition of ignorance, people wish to listen to it. This is the fourth wonderful and marvelous thing. So even though there are these issues out there, people seem to be kind of fascinated with the idea of what the Buddha wants to say about those. And then he doesn't go on about that, but just introduces those ideas. In number two, on page 192, gratification, danger, and escape. So this is a category, so we have three different short sutras that fit within this. So the first one he talks about is before my enlightenment. Before my enlightenment, O monks, while I was still a bodhisattva, it occurred to me, what is the gratification in the world, the danger in the world, the escape from the world? Whatever pleasure and joy is the gratification in the world. The world is impermanent, bound up with suffering, and, the sub and subject to change. This is the danger in the world. The removal and abandoning of desire and lust for the world is the escape from the world. But when I directly knew this, then I claimed to have awakened. So it wasn't until he fully understood those things that he considered himself to be enlightened or awakened. The second one, I set out seeking. It was basically um, has the same three in it here. Oh monks, I set out seeking the gratification in the world. Whatever gratification there is in the world that I have found. I set out seeking the danger in the world. Whatever danger there is that I have found. I set out seeking an escape from the world. Whatever escape there is from the world that I have found. So just another way of bringing up those three particular points. And then the third one, if there were no gratification. If, monks, there were no gratification in the world, beings would not be enamored with the world. But because there is gratification, beings become enamored with it. And then he goes through the same for danger and for escape. So the third category here is properly appraising objects of attachment. And thus I have heard Paragraph two, a number of monks went to uh, Savati for alms, still, still kind of, excuse me, early. Uh, so they went to a park of wanderers of other sects and sat down with them. And they said to the monks, friends, ascetic Gautama describes the full understanding of sensual pleasures, and we do, we do so too. So. And we have a full, the Gautama describes a full understanding of form, understanding of feelings. What then is the distinction, the variance, the difference? And so going to the next page, paragraph four, those monks neither approved nor disproved the wanderer's words. They rose from their seats and went away thinking, hmm, we shall come to understand the meaning of these words in the Blessed One's presence. So they weren't quite clear either about what that difference was. 
So they went to the Blessed One, and he said, what is the gratification? What is the danger? And what is the escape in sensual pleasures? About form and feelings and all of those things. And so then we go on, and there's a fairly long text on each of these three. So we start with the sensual pleasures. And so here he says, monks, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. And so basically the five senses. So forms, the physical aspect, uh, what uh, that are wished for, desired, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. And then sounds, odors, flavors, tactile objects. These are the five. The pleasure and joy that arise are the gratification. And what monks is the danger? On account of the craft by which a clansman makes a living, he has to face cold and heat. He is injured by contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, those tarred mosquitoes, wind, sun, and creeping things. He risks death by hunger and thirst. Now, this is the danger of sensual pleasures. In paragraph 9, if no property comes to the clansman while he works, he sorrows, grieves, and laments, becomes distraught, crying, my work is in vain, my effort is fruitless. This too is a danger in the case of sensual pleasures. If property comes to the clansman, he experiences pain and grief in protecting it. Kings nor thieves make off with my property, neither kings nor thieves make off with my property, nor fire burn it, nor water sweep it away, nor unloved ears make off with it. It's a question. And he guards and protects his property, keep people from making off with it. He burns it or sweeps it away, nor make off with it. He sorrows, grieves, and laments. This too is a danger. So there's the possibility people will do those things, or there's all the angu anguish and anxiety that he has about trying to keep people from doing that. In 11, again, kings quarrel. Uh, Katyas, Brahmins, householders, mother, son, father, brother, sister, friend, all these people quarrel with other, each other. They attack each other with fists, clods, sticks, or knives, whereby they incur death or deadly suffering. This too is a danger. And then again, the next one, 12, he talks about battle and various aspects of that. Um, more battle examples in 13. In 14, again, with sensual pleasures as a cause, men break into houses, plunder wealth, commit burglary, ambush highways, seduce others' wives, and then they are caught. Kings have many kinds of torture inflicted on them, whereby they incur death or deadly suffering. In 15, again, people indulge in misconduct, body, speech, and mind. Reborn in a state of misery and bad destination, the lower world in hell. And in 16, what monks is the escape in this case of sensual pleasures? It is the removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for sensual pleasures. In 17, the ascetics and Brahmins who do not understand cannot fully understand nor instruct others. That is impossible. So how can you teach if you really don't understand, basically? Those ascetics and Brahmins who understand it as it really is can fully understand and instruct others so that they can fully understand. That is possible. So then on 197 we go on to form. And what monks is the gratification in the case of form? Suppose that there were a girl in the Katya class or the Brahmin class or the householder stock in her 15th or 16th year, neither too tall nor too short, neither too thin nor too fat, neither too dark nor too fair. Is her beauty and loveliness then at its height? Yes, venerable sir, so they're responding to him. Now the, qu the pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on that beauty and loveliness are the gratification in the case of form. And what monks is the danger? That same woman, here at 80, 90, or 100 years, aged and crooked, doubled up, supported by a walking stick, tottering, frail, her youth gone, her teeth broken, gray-haired, scanty-haired, bald, wrinkled, with limbs all blotchy, this is the danger in the case of form. Again, afflicted, suffering, gravely ill, 
and then again, so it goes through those, and then in 21, as a corpse thrown aside in a charnel ground, and then 22 to 29, again, devoured by crows, hawks, vultures, dogs, jackals, or various kinds of worms, and then a long list of other kinds of things that could happen to the corpse. And then on page 198, paragraph 30, and what, monks, is the escape? Is this removal of desire, it is this removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust. This is the escape in the case of form. Those ascetics and Brahmins who do not understand, cannot understand or instruct others. That is impossible. Those who do understand um, that it is gratification as gratification, danger as danger, and escape as escape, can fully understand and instruct others. That is possible. So then he goes through feelings in a very similar way to wh how he's gone through the other two categories. And what, monks, is the gratification in the case of feelings? Secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, the monk enters upon and dwells in the first jhana. Accompanied by the thought and examination with rapture and happiness. On that occasion, he feels only feeling, and that is free from affliction. Again, while stilling thought and examination, dwells the second jhana, with fading away as well as uh, well of rapture. He then dwells in the third jhana, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain. He dwells in the fourth jhana. And then he feels free from affliction. And what, monks, is the danger in the case of feelings? Feelings are impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. This is the danger in the case of feelings. Next page, and what, monks, is the escape in the case of feelings? It is the removal of desire and lust, abandonment of desire and lust for feelings. Those ascetics and Brahmins who do not understand cannot understand or instruct others. That is impossible. Those who understand that gratification is gratification, danger is danger, escape as escape, can fully understand and instruct others as well. So that's his overview about the issues in each of these different categories of uh, looking at these in terms of the, the first one were the central pleasures and then the form and then the feelings aspects of all of those and some of the gratification and dangers associated with each. Then we go on to number category number four here, look at the dangers, the pitfalls in sensual pleasures. And here, the first one is called cutting off all affairs. So the householders, Potalia, ask the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, how is the cutting off of affairs, uh, here things, talking about things such as cutting off business, speech, designation, intentions of a householder uh, versus the Dharma. So how is the cutting off of affairs in the Noble One's discipline achieved entirely and in all ways? Teach me the Dharma. In paragraph 15, Householders, suppose a dog overcome by hunger and weakness is waiting by a butcher shop. Then a skilled butcher or his apprentice would toss the dog a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton of meatless bones smeared with blood. Would that dog get rid of his hunger and weakness? No, eventually that dog would reap weariness and disappointment. Nothing there but the bone. On page 200, so too, householder, sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton by the Blessed One. He provide, uh, they provide much suffering and much despair. The danger in them is still more. Having seen this, he avoids equanimity that is diversified. Um, I think he's referring to uh, kind of a me versus you thing in terms of uh, equanimity here, and develops the equanimity that is unified, where clinging to the carnal things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. Suppose a vulture, a heron, or a hawk seized a piece of meat and flew away, and then other vultures, herons, and hawks pursued it and pecked and clawed it. If that first vulture, heron, or hawk does not quickly let go of the piece of meat, wouldn't it hereby incur death or deadly suffering? Yes, venerable sir. 
So too, householder, sensual pleasures have been compared to a piece of meat by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair. Suppose a man took a blazing grass torch and went against the wind, and burned his hand or his arm or some other part of his body. He might incur death or deadly suffering. So sensual pleasures have been compared to a grass torch and provide much suffering and despair. And then in 18, suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals without flame or smoke. Then a man came, and two strong men seized him by both arms and dragged him toward that pit. Would that man twist his body this way and that? Yes, and because that man knows that if he falls into the pit, he will incur death or deadly suffering. So sensual pleasures have been compared to a charcoal pit. They provide much suffering and much despair. In 19, householders suppose a man dreamed about lovely parks, lovely groves, lovely meadows, and lovely lakes, and on waking, he saw nothing of them. So too, sensual pleasures have been compared to a dream. They provide much suffering and much despair. In 20, suppose a man borrowed goods on loan, a fancy carriage, and fine jewel earrings, and went to the marketplace. Then people, seeing him, would say, Sirs, that is a rich man. Then the owners, whenever they saw him, would take back their things. So too, sensual pleasures have been compared to borrowed goods. They provide much suffering and much despair. In 21, Suppose a dense grove not far from some village or town had a fruit-laden tree. Then a man came needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit, and he entered the grove. And he thought, let me climb this tree, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. Then a second man came, and he thought similarly, let me cut down this tree at its root, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag, and did so. If that first man who had climbed the tree doesn't come down quickly when the tree falls, wouldn't he break his hand or foot or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or deadly suffering? Yes, venerable sir. So too, householder, sensual pleasure has, pleasures have been compared to fruits on a tree. They provide much suffering and much despair. Having seen this thus, as it really is, with proper wisdom, he avoids the equanimity that is diversified and develops the equanimity that is unified. Clinging to the carnal things of the world utterly ceases without <coughs> remainder. So a part of this is how we see things as opposed to what they're actually like. It doesn't mean that we don't need fruit to eat or other kinds of things uh, and that we can't enjoy those things as long as we're not really attached to them and grasp after them and so forth. That's where we get into trouble. But if we can see them as they really are, the phrase that's often used, then we can avoid that kind of attachment to them. The next one here is the fever of sensual pleasures. So here he's focused on the lust and the craving aspects of these. So in paragraph number 10 on the second line, the five chords of sensual pleasure with forms recognizable by the eye, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, and flavors cognizable by the tongue, tactile objects uh, cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. So an intense sense of gotta have this kind of thing. So again, he's not talking about the middle way, but an extreme. And the last paragraph there, Having understood the origin, the passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape from case of such pleasures, I abandoned craving. I removed the fever of sensual pleasures with a mind inwardly at peace. That's a word that he often uses to describe nirvana as a sense of, of peace. Not that it makes everything else calm and so forth, uh, but to be in that state while all this turmoil is going on around you. So other people devoured by craving, burning with fever, indulging in sensual pleasures. 
And then in number 11 here, he refers to the rich, the affluent, and the wealthy, and their sensual pleasures, and goes through that. And because at the bottom of that section, because divine sensual pleasures are more excellent and sublime than human sensual pleasures. And then in 12, um, he mentions again, I abandoned craving for sensual pleasures. And on 204, with a mind inwardly at peace. And gives another example in 13 of a leper with sores and blisters, devoured by worms, scratching scabs and, and opening his wounds, and his friends and companions seeking a physician to help him and bring him medicine so he can be cured of the leprosy and become well and happy. And then he might see another leper. And would that man envy the other leper? No, because when there is sickness, there is need for medicine. And when there is no sickness, there is no need for medicine. So when there's no desire in lust for lust, and, uh, uh, there is no desire or lust, then there is no need for those things. So we have a state of peace. And then on the next page on 16, he goes on to say, in the past, sensual pleasures were painful to touch, hot and scorching. In the future, sensual pleasures will be painful to touch, hot and scorching. And now at present, sensual pleasures are painful to touch, hot and scorching. People who are not free from lust for sensual pleasures are devoured by craving. They are impaired. And then at the bottom of the page, a few lines up, the more they indulge in sensual pleasures, the more their craving for sensual pleasures increases, and the more they are burned by the fever of sensual pleasures. So we get then to a point where we're consumed by greed for those things. So we'll take a little break here.